everybody to another episode of Triple C. Today I've got on my helmet to protect my head in the uh, zero-g environment of my spacecraft and I've got my sword to protect myself against uh, aliens. Is that an alien? What's that? Get out of here alien! Where are they coming from? They just teleported into my spaceship. Is it from the future? Well, this is all on theme actually. We're talking about Gene Wolfe's the Book of the New Sun series. Uh, we begin with uh, Shadow and Claw, which collects the first two books. That is The Shadow of the Torturer and The Claw of the Conciliator. 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 Oh. The next book is uh, Sword and Citadel, and uh, includes The Sword of the Lictor and The Citadel of the Autark. And uh, also I'm including book number five, even though the original... Dude, you gotta leave me alone! I'm trying to make a video! Sorry, these aliens, man. Uh, those four make up the original um, Book of the New Sun series, but uh, later on Mr. Wolf writes another one, um, The Earth of the New Sun, which uh, make it makes the whole thing a... Uh, oh, wow. Um, well, I, I forgot what the word would be for it. A tetralogy? But anyway, the fifth one here kind of wraps everything up that was left a little bit uh, hanging at the end of the Book of the New Sun series. So this is a uh, this is a science fiction series that uh, reads an awful lot like uh, a fantasy series because it uh, takes place in very distant future Earth. The setting is extremely cool. Um, the sun is burning out this far in the future, so even during the daytime, stars are visible. There's also all kinds of really really interesting uh, extraterrestrial life forms on Earth. Uh, which is the planet that everybody's on. They spell it differently, as you may have noticed in the title of the book. It's U-R-T-H, but uh, I'm pretty sure that it is the Earth that we're on right now, as we know it. Language has changed, because this is so far in the future. And uh, elements of technology and um, alien races have been brought to the planet. And um, the sort of technology that we have now, uh, including languages, writing, um, and generally, society um, has been lost to the distant past. So the story follows a hero, uh, Severian, who um, grows up as an orphan and is taken in by a, um, oh, I suppose they are an order of society. The, um, the hierarchy um, of society is, plays a big part in the book, so I'm not going to talk too much about it. It's something that's interesting to figure out as you read but uh, basically, the dudes that uh, raise Severian and teach him their ways are called the uh, Guild of Torturers, which is about as gnarly as it sounds. Um, their whole job is taking people who have been condemned by the higher-ups and tormenting them according to uh, their orders, and then usually executing them. And it starts off when Severian falls in love with one of those that uh, they've brought in to be tortured and executed. I won't go into too much detail, as usual, because the, just watching the story unfold is really, really beautiful. There's a great flow in the narrative here. Severian has something of a superpower of his own, but it's just photographic memory. He can remember everything that he sees and reads and says and hears. So it's written autobiography style by Severian from his perspective, first person. And you get this really interesting sort of detached, uh, sort of a detached narrative because uh, Severian's a very thoughtful person. He's not forceful. He doesn't necessarily come off as resentful. He's very accepting of the stuff that's happened in his past and shaped him, and that comes out just in the word choice and the sentence structure, because everything that's happened in his sort of diary, which is what this comes out as, or his journal anyway, is uh, tragic. There is a very dramatic, well, more than one very dramatic turn in the in the events as you see Severian come to rise in 
power and status and see his understanding of uh, the world increase because uh, there are a lot of mysteries. You find out relatively early on that time travel is involved. That's not really a spoiler. And there, uh, the whole crux of, of what's going on in this world is the introduction of the new sun, um, as in the title. The new sun is required to keep life on Earth going and Severian is connected to the, um, what would be the, see this is one of those things that's hard to explain without giving a lot away, but essentially Severian is, uh, I keep bonking my helmet with my sword. Severian is deeply connected to the events that will bring the new sun to Earth. It doesn't really tell you much about that in the first four books basically just tells you that it's a prophecy and it's it made clear that it is all very important how would you bring a new star to earth though very interesting question that's why I got the fifth book uh, the earth of the new sun and I'm including it in here along with the first four because it gets into that tells you how that goes we get to see Severian take a trip on a spaceship which is pretty cool because the whole first four books all take place on Earth with relatively low-tech um, environment and equipment. Um, here's one of my favorite things in um, in fiction is uh, when the hero just gets a cool-ass sword. Let's be real, there's just something dope about a cool-ass sword and uh, Severian's is no exception. It's an executioner's blade because he's been trained as a, as a torturer and an executioner, so when he is... Uh, eventually leaves his guild to go on a journey across Earth. He makes money by performing executions at different different places and on different types of people. And these all work into his his understanding and his discovery of himself and basically guides him as as he meets these people, understands their stories, understands the reasoning behind the killings that he performs they all shape him and it all it all gets tied together in a, in a pretty grandiose and satisfactory way by the time Earth of the New Sun comes around and like I said there's a lot of tragedy in the meantime which you might expect there are some very interesting characters in here you will not expect or be able to anticipate the kind of stuff that Severian runs into and the dialogue is all very uh, much of that high fantasy type feel. Hardly anything like, um, oh, you know, the Warm War Boris or the old English style stuff. It's just very erudite, I suppose. Which I like a lot. I'll go ahead and bring up another peeve. I guess this is the first peeve I've talked about. I'm in a good mood, so I'm not really thinking much about things that annoy me. But, uh, but here's one. Whenever you've got a fantasy story... And this is a little bit more forgivable in science fiction, but whenever you've got a fantasy story where you've got characters that are speaking just some like regular old uh, American English vernacular, man, that sets me off. I don't really. It takes you out of the um, takes you out of the whole thing. Um, makes it kind of keeps it at the forefront of your mind that you're reading a fantasy story, and when you just go like balls deep into the fantasy and you have characters talk like nobody on this planet actually talks, that sort of makes it easier to get into and easier to lose yourself in. And Gene Wolfe does a great job with all that. You get very much absorbed into uh, Severian's quest and you're always excited to see the kind of stuff that he runs across because it is wild. Like I said, you will not be able to anticipate the twists and turns in his journey the characters that come and go from his life and you gotta root for the guy because he's a scrappy dude for sure he may not be oh um a champion of traditional morality but that almost makes you want to root for him more because you clearly see the um, decision-making processes that he undergoes and uh, that guide each and every one of his steps and and he makes some pretty far out decisions but you you never feel like he's crazy 
you do feel his desperation. And again, that's one of those things that comes out because of the way that this is written like an autobiographical narrative. It's detached and it's uh, impersonal, but whenever Severian does really feel something, you know it. He, he makes it evident without being, um, well, without being uh, overly dramatic or histrionic about things. So you really do feel like you are reading a dude's biography and you get to know him and you get to care about his, his struggles and um, whenever he does something, the kind of thing that would make you go, oh no, he, then uh, he feels it too. He feels it too. He makes mistakes and, uh, and he doesn't go overboard with trying to correct him. He doesn't beat himself up, but he does acknowledge them. So, all in all, Severian is one of the most interesting protagonists that I've ever read about in this kind of science fiction fantasy crossover. It is weird to call it such a thing. It's not a crossover at all. That's a dumb word. It's a dumb thing for me to say. It was just on the tip of my tongue. But um, it's not, not even Sword and Planet. It's, it's pretty much fairly rigid science fiction. But... <clears throat> It's extremely creative. It's extremely imaginative. Like I said, it reads like fantasy because at first it's pretty much dealing with horses and swords and cloaks, different kinds of armor, that kind of stuff. But uh, before too long, you get into directed energy weapons and teleportation and time travel. Very, very good series. I highly recommend if you read the first four, read the fifth one, read the Earth of the New Sun. Gene Wolfe continues this series in the, I believe it's called The Book of the Long Sun, and I am going to read those. I have another uh, Gene Wolfe um, duology coming up here, uh, which I don't remember what it's called. The Knight and the Wizard, I think? Anyway, definitely get into more of his stuff because it's outstanding, and uh, I can't recommend this series enough. If any of that sounds intriguing at all.